Welcome back to the vlog, and this week I want to learn how to stop using my hands so expressively. And I want to take a look at some of these Christmas myths that exist today and how they butchered their source material. I'm already losing this battle. Merry Christmas! Or if you're from a different faith system, Happy Hanukkah, Merry Kwanzaa, I'm not sure that's the right way to say it, Happy Solstice, basically whatever holiday you're celebrating, I wish you happiness and joy this season. As I said, I'm Brett Hetherington from Head First Studios, and this week I'm going to take a look, just a few minutes, at some of those things we tell each other at Christmas that you might not realize are actually myths. Myth number one, we three kings. Really? We Three Kings is one of the most inaccurate Christmas carols in all of recorded history. It never states in the Bible that there were three kings. In fact, it calls them wise men and does not list a number. As wise men, they were very knowledgeable of ancient Jewish prophecies, and as astronomers, they would have noticed a difference in the heavens. The Bible never says where the East is. It could have been Syria, Arabia, or even China which would be Orient, yes I know. They were not there on the night Jesus was born. They showed up like two years later. Myth number two. Away in a manger, no crying he makes? It is not likely at all that Jesus did not cry. Now the Bible doesn't specify, but we do know from scripture that he was fully God and fully man. So he had all the traits of both. I don't know about you, but I've got three kids, and there was never a point in their infancy and in their young childhood days where they weren't willing to cry to let me know they were hungry or hurt, or just tired, need to be put to sleep, put to bed, put to sleep doesn't sound right. So yes, very likely that he was not a silent infant, and it probably was not a silent night. Myth number three, there was no room at the inn. Now, Here's where we get a little bit hazy based on the scripture translation you're reading. Because as we take the original Greek and translate it into modern day English, there are different ways to do it. Now I'm a big ESV guy and it does say in, but if you do a quick search, there are a lot of other translations. A few use in, most of them just refer to there was no room for them or a long Something along those lines. Now Luke's Gospel, the words in Greek there, the word is actually more along the lines of guest room or guest house, not hotel. There are no donkeys, no animals, no sheep, no horse, no cow lowing. How does a cattle low? Cattle is the plural. How does a cow low? Moo. Moo. That one didn't sound like a cow. In fact, Jewish purity laws would have eliminated all of those animals being present for the birth because it would have been unclean for Mary to give birth, surrounded by all those beasts. Myth number three, Xmas takes the Christ out of Christmas. <sighs> okay, the word Christ in Greek is written like this. That first letter, and I'm gonna botch up the pronunciation because I, I study more Hebrew than Greek in college, but it's Kai, or the English equivalent of X. Rather than being a really offensive way to remove Christ from Christmas, it's actually a fairly logical abbreviation. Myth number D. The Christmas tree has always been a Christian symbol. Now here's the thing with Christmas trees, you can find multiple different origins for them, and you gotta trace them back to the earliest ones. It's a lot like the origins of Halloween. Cultures celebrate it differently, but you gotta trace it back to the roots. So doing a little research, I trace it back. Christmas trees go back as far as Egypt, where they would bring palm trees, because they don't have pine trees in Egypt. They bring them into the homes to celebrate life after death, life continuing beyond death, which is what Christians believe in when it comes to heaven. Life continues. It doesn't end and start over. It continues. Death is a pause button. So this is the earliest known tradition of bringing a tree inside to celebrate a particular event or thought. 
Now you jump forward a bunch of centuries to the Old Testament age, you get to the prophet Jeremiah. He actually decries bringing a tree inside and decorating it as a form of worship. And now in the 1850s, there was a missionary who decided he was going to bring a tree in, chop it down, bring it in the house, and use this example as being evergreen for everlasting, everlasting life, life that goes on forever, and the fact that it points up to the heavens. This is the symbol that was co-opted. He took a pagan tradition and brought it into the Christian faith. Beautiful symbolism in it. Evergreen, pointing towards the heaven. You put a star on the top, sometimes an angel. I prefer a star, but hey, that's me. But it was not always so. I feel like an NBC The More You Know commercial. Da -da -da -da. So there you have it. Probably shattered your thoughts on what Christmas was like all the centuries ago. But maybe I gave you something to think about when those popular Christmas carols come on or someone starts telling the story of the birth of Jesus and you hear, ah, that doesn't sound right. Maybe I've encouraged you to open your own Bible and read the birth of Jesus for yourself rather than listen to what someone else says. And hopefully I've made it all fun for you. You've enjoyed exploring these myths with me. That's all I have for this week. Next week, I'm going to take a look at uh, one of my favorite Christmas TV episodes that I watch every year, sometimes multiple times. So you keep watching, I'll keep sharing stories and maybe some myths along the way.